Super Mario Bros. 3 had its initial debut in Japan on October 23, 1988, with the American and European releases following in February 1990 and then August of 1991. This game is my personal favorite NES Mario title, and I think that the design of the game is seriously timeless. And today, I'm going to be talking about all of the things that ended up being scrapped or unused in the game. This game has unused enemies, areas, code, objects, graphics, and a lot of other things, and like with all of my videos, I hope that you learn something new. So in my last two videos, I really didn't stress enough how important this is, but these videos would not be possible without the writers and researchers over at the cutting room floor. The cutting room floor is an amazing resource that catalogs unused and scrapped content in hundreds of thousands of different games, and they have hundreds of documented games from various publishers, so a massive portion of the research and writing in this video is heavily attributed to their page for Mario 3. If you'd like to see more about something I might leave out, or if you're just interested in looking at games that you might want to see, then I highly recommend going to the cutting room floor at trcf.net. So again, huge thanks to the cutting room floor being an incredible resource, and with that, it's time to talk about the content. So the first section of this video will go over some of the general things from the front page of the cutting room floor. So starting with the debug mode. By using this Game Genie code on any version of the game, it will activate a level select as well as a debug mode. If you press up or down on the title screen, it'll select a world to start on. And from the footage I was able to find of this, it seems like it only does it one at a time, which can be a little annoying, but hey, at least it works, right? Pressing A increases the number of lives by 5, with a tile on screen changing each time you press the button. A, B, and down on controller 2 will warp you to the princess's chamber at the end of the game, and A, B, and right warps you straight to the final curtain. Something that's also cool is that when you start the game, your item box is pre-filled with one of every item plus an extra warp whistle, with the remaining slots being filled with P-wings. The other two debug codes are activated in gameplay. Pressing select on controller 1 cycles through all of Mario's power-ups, but it won't cycle through the power star. And A or B plus select will give Mario a Goomba's shoe. It has the chance of looking weird in certain levels, but otherwise the shoe works as intended. There's two other codes that were disconnected from the rest as leftovers, and they consist of a free movement mode and invincibility. It's unknown how the free movement mode would have been activated, but I'm sure it would have worked the same way as the one in Super Mario World does. We do know how to toggle invincibility, which is by pressing select, but it's only possible when you change some things around in the code. Mario 3 originally had a feature that let a player respawn when they died in co-op. When the code is reactivated, the player will respawn with invincibility frames until the player moves. It's possible to restore this behavior by using this code with the Game Genie, but it will eventually break over time. Next we're going to be talking about the unused objects. There's actually not that many of them, but the first ones I'll talk about are objects 4 and 5. With the object IDs 04 and 05, these two textures don't even have their tiles in the ROM anymore, but they did have a tile set that they were meant to use. Object 4 would have stuck to the player if they collided with it, kind of like how a micro Goomba does, but it would never come off. The object wouldn't have slowed down the player either, and it would have been possible to kill it with a Koopa shell or a hammer. Object 5 was going to walk around like any other enemy does, with the entity jumping up to Mario's Y position and then falling back down. Something interesting is that walking into it would bounce the player back in the other direction, with the only way to get damaged by the object is to let it fall right on top of the player. It can also be destroyed in the same way as Object 4. Object 0A is the first object here that has defined graphics, but even this is just a mock-up of what best fits the object. 0A is just a stationary block that can be pushed by Mario and Luigi. It can also apparently be pushed into walls, with the collision detection not having been completed for it. Objects 21, 22, and 23 are stationary versions of the cards that are at the end of every level in the game, and collecting them adds that card to your inventory, but do note that there's nothing in the code to handle when you collect one of these as your third and last card. Another thing is that this object calls for a subroutine called object underscore move and rebound off wall, with these being the only objects to actually call for this in the code. But the object never moves at all. So what's even the point? 
Of these next two objects, only the Cheap Cheap has an ID, being 88, with the Parabeetle not having any ID at all. The Tan Cheap Cheap only appears in one level, with that level not being used, and it also swims faster than the red and green versions of the enemy. As for the Parabeetle, it can only be spawned by using something called the Parabeetle Swarm object, and it also flies faster than the red ones. There's not a lot of these, but some levels in the game have unused palette variations. The fortress in the final game uses a standard white palette for the blocks, but the palette on the right is an unused green version of it, and I'm not really sure what Nintendo's plan was with it. Along with the green castle one, there's also three other ones, being this set for the giant stage that uses shades of gray with blue water, a plains palette with a different colored sky, and this last one is kind of hard to tell what the palette difference is, but it's actually only down to the blue rectangle being a slightly different color. Just like with Super Mario World, Super Mario Bros. 3 is no stranger to hidden objects. There's only two to talk about, and I'm guessing that they have to do with being from an older level design. And the first hidden tile would be a singular brick block in 4-1, being completely removed in the finished game. And then we have this one in 5-2 that's also just a singular block, being a cloud that appears behind a slope. I don't know what is happening to my voice, but these next two things are oddities. The graphic that originally came out of the hammer suit item box looked like this, with people saying that this one looks more like a toad suit than it does a normal hammer suit. The design's inspiration most likely comes from the actual Hammer Bros themselves, but why this one doesn't match any other inventory sprites, nobody really knows. Nintendo did change this, but only for the remakes of the game and not the original, so... If you hit a P-Switch in a level that has Gelectros, which are these things, it causes them to turn into silver coins, but only visually. The only two levels in the game that actually have Gelectros in them being 3-5 and 7-4, don't have P-switches in them, and this screenshot is the best example I could find that actually shows them turning into coins, and if you tried to collect the coins you would just take damage, and just like with the Toad suit, this doesn't happen in the remix. The red and black curtains that show up before the title screen are red and black, but something fascinating about it is that Nintendo didn't intend to make it look like this. The curtains are supposed to have white highlights, but the highlights in the game are drawn using the transparent part of the palette, and this combined with the black background during the opening cutscene makes the curtains look like how they do in the game. I think that this accident was a good one because I like how much easier on the eyes the left one is. And sure, you could argue that the one on the right looks more polished, and I'd probably agree, but I think it's objectively harder on the eyes than the original. Alright, well that's all the uncategorized general stuff. So now it's time to move on to everything we know about the pre-release. When the original Super Mario Bros. was finished in 1983, development for Super Mario Bros. 3 immediately started right after. I talked about this detail specifically in the Mario World video, but when development started for Mario 3, Shigeru Miyamoto originally wanted Mario to ride a horse. He drew this concept photo and put it on the wall where he usually worked, and the devs took note of this but couldn't implement it on the NES due to limitations, and so the idea was shelved until the release of Super Mario World. Game TV was a VHS series for video game reviews as well as previews that were released by the makers of the Famitsu magazine in Japan. The episode on screen, released in around July of 1988, shows off some early footage of Super Mario Bros. 3 just a couple months before it came out. This video specifically shows off early gameplay of World 1-1 and what I think is 1-5. The footage basically shows off some of the level designs, basic mechanics, and other things, but for the levels and UI themselves, there's actually quite a lot. So for the initial footage, the status bar always displays the character name instead of what level you're on, with this example being for Mario, and the other one is that the shrinking animation uses Mario's crouching sprite instead of a unique sprite for it. I'm guessing it was because Nintendo just didn't get around to making it by that point. 1-1's changes are more to do with changes to the level itself rather than the UI, and the stage begins normally, and the immediate changes are the first two sets of question blocks being too far to the right of where they are in the final, as well as placement changes to the enemies and the platforms. The other differences have to do with the behavior of enemies like the Venus fire traps, 
and that the timer originally started at 400 instead of 300 like it does now. The video also features World 1-5, but it doesn't really show anything else. More footage of the game was shown off in September of 1988 in the Fami manga, with a little bit of 1-3 followed by a couple of screenshots. The small portion of live gameplay shows Mario kicking a Koopa shell, as well as breaking some blocks, and the level itself is just an older version of 1-3. The differences I noticed first was that the ground is taller in the Fami manga, and that there's also a second Koopa. The first screenshot is of an area in 1-3 that is off-screen to the left in the Famimanga screenshot, and nothing in this area is still in the final game, with the exception of only the large bush in the background. The Japanese caption in the short clip says, The turtle also turns into a weapon, with the turtle obviously referring to the Koopa. These next screenshots compare the Famimanga with early box art of an unknown level. As far as we know, the level is just a hilly stage with a bunch of parabeetles flying by, with it most resembling 1-2, at least to me. It has a very slight resemblance to unused level 3 in that they both share a tile set, background, and that there's parabeetles flying all over. Unused level 3 has no ground enemies, and both this and the last two screenshots have Mario's position being way too far to the right when he's supposed to be more in the middle. This screenshot is in the same position, and the only thing that's different in this one are the stats on the bottom. Next we have an airship, and a screenshot that might be from the actual gameplay. The airship one has interesting design choices in it, with my favorite one being the cross cannon being placed under the platform, making it completely cut off in some places. And as for the second one, it's most likely taken from actual gameplay footage. I don't really think there's anything special about it, but it is worth noting that the pipes in the image are slightly thinner than they are in the final game. This image depicts a level with multiple hammer bros in a stacked fashion, but since this scenario is never seen in any real level in the game, I'm leaning towards the idea that this was part of a test. The early battle with the Morton Koopa is one of the more interesting ones. First of all, Morton has a completely different palette. The arena uses the layout of Iggy's fight instead of a unique one, and my favorite one, the windows. I'm not gonna lie, the windows really make it feel like it's taking place inside of an actual airship and not in some dark arena. I actually think it completely changes the environment, at least by interpretation, but I know that other people see it different. This Famicom ad for Mario 3 shows a lot of screenshots from earlier versions of the game. And from the ones that we can see, there's actually quite a lot to cover. We can see a map screen of World 1, with changes including the path being initially blocked by a gate that leads directly into the fortress. Level 3 is located where level 4 is. The spade panel is located to the left of the fortress. And the south toad house is just not even there. Also, the status bar is displaying zero lives, which is not normally possible in the game, so that's weird. There's also some unused levels like this sky level which has an interesting visual of the sky being dark blue and having a gradient that fades into black on the top, which isn't seen anywhere else in the game. This castle level with unique brick blocks, which looks a lot like the castle tile sets from Super Mario Bros. 2. The next level shows up twice in the image, with this being a composite of the two screenshots. It appears once with the right side cropped out, and again being obscured by Mario's foot. It shows an early version of the pipe maze from the second fortress in World 4, and the immediate change I notice is that those two Goombas are not at all present in the final game. The pipes are also slightly thinner. Next we have an athletic level, kind of like World 1-6, but the design isn't really similar to anything else. The status bar in this one also has zero lives, and this wooden pillar is colored white for some reason. This screenshot looks a lot like it's from 7-9, but the things that set it apart from actual 7-9 are pretty interesting. The first and most obvious thing is that the pipes are all pink, the coins in the screenshot are unreachable unless broken by this pipe connector, and in the final version, regular brick blocks replace this. The last thing for the pre-release is some more early footage from the Fami manga from November of 1988. There's not really many other differences in this video, but the ones that are, are either ones that I've already talked about, or they were fixed or replaced by something else. The footage itself is pretty fascinating to watch on its own though. 
So now that we're done with the pre-release section, it's time to talk about the unused levels. Super Mario Bros. 3 has about as many unused levels as Super Mario World does. And to start it off, we'll start with the most simple level being the fourth two-player level. This stage, featuring a bunch of coins and an unused block graphic, was apparently meant to be another level in the two-player mode that I'll get into later in the video. Something interesting is that when a coin is collected in this, an incorrect tile appears in its place. It's thought that the level might have been a game mode where whoever can collect the most coins wins due to the code related to it, but the code that would have handled that specifically isn't in the ROM for the game. This level, being a World 7 Hammer Bros stage, would have shown up in World 7, but the problem is that World 7 doesn't have any Hammer Brothers. The design of the stage itself also doesn't show up anywhere else in the game either. Now onto the numeric unused levels. Unused level 1 looks like an early version of 5-3. It has Goomba's shoe, spines, and connecting pipes, but the main differences to the final version are mainly the fact that you start out on the left side of the map, since you start on the right side in the final game, and the fact that this stage has multiple connecting pipes when real 5-3 only has one. Unused level 2 doesn't resemble any other level in the game. It's most similar to 3-9 with the pipes connecting to the water area, but the enemy setups are completely different. The ending is also really weird. You appear out of nowhere, and going in the pipe in front of you takes you to a coin heaven, which also appears out of nowhere, which then leads to a treasure box containing a Lakitu's cloud. The only way to exit the stage is by flying over this structure here, and only then will you be able to leave. Unused level 3 is most likely an earlier version of 7-3. There's almost zero enemies on the entire level, and the pink note block that leads to the coin heaven is really hard to reach since it immediately bumps you down into the pit below it when you try to hit it. Something else that's funny is that there's also a singular coin floating in the sky. I think he needs a friend. Unused level 4 looks like a harder version of 1-5, with piranhas placed at the foot of every slope. There's also no coin heaven in this one, but every other resemblance to 1-5 is there from what I can tell. Level 5 has many unused tanuki suit bonus rooms in it, which I'm assuming was made as a quick way to test bonus room layouts before actually putting them in the game. The only way to explore all of the rooms is by using a Game Genie code that lets you walk through walls, and the white wall simply returns you back to the world map, and the pipes lead to an empty room where you just fall until you die. Level 6 looks like it was planned to be in World 6, but it was eventually removed entirely. The whole level moves up and down, and it also showcases a bug in which if you jump in the middle of the moving platform as Super Mario and stand still, when you pass the wooden block, You'll stomp the cheap sheep and the fire chomp and then be standing in midair. I couldn't find a video of this, but I imagine it being similar to this glitch from Super Mario Bros. Another interesting thing is that a pointer to this level still exists on top of the start tile in World 1. Nintendo probably put a level tile here during development in order to quickly test new levels, and to make this level accessible again from the start tile, use this Game Genie code for your respective game version. Unused level 7 is similar to level 6 in structure, but the level itself is much different. It's an auto-scroller with Gelectros, kind of like 7-4, and it's possible that the concept for this level was originally planned for World 6, but got held back until World 7, causing this stage to not be included. Also, the power-up at the beginning is nearly impossible to get because the screen immediately scrolls down and you pretty much need to play like Tass to consistently collect the power-up before it's gone. And the gold cheap sheep is also featured here, but hardly appears since it doesn't take a lot of them to cause a sprite overload. Unused level 8 is a vertical level that requires the player to swim up these waterfalls in order to get to the exit. Aside from the singular rooms, this is the shortest level so far, and it also doesn't have any enemies or even a proper exit. It's assumed to have been a part of a larger level like 7-1, but like with all of the rest of the levels, it's not easy to say for certain. Level 9 is a pretty simple cloud stage that features blocks moving up and down, parabeetles, as well as the unused green variant of the beetles, and there's not really much else to say about this one since it's pretty basic. By the way, we're almost done, we have like 5 more. Level 10 is similar to the last, 
but this one was most likely intended to be a coin heaven in whatever level it was designed for. It uses the same sprite table as level 9, and if implemented, it would have been the only coin heaven to have been accessible through a pipe. Stage 11 appears to be an early version of 1-6. The biggest change here is the lack of line-following platforms, and there's also more enemies in this level than in real 1-6. Level 12 is another version of 1-6, but is smaller and much more incomplete than level 11. It doesn't have an end goal, its starting position is way above the ground, and the only way to get out of the level is by falling out of it. 13 is pretty much exactly the same as 12, but everything is moved down by one block, and you also don't start in midair like how you do in level 12. 14 is also pretty odd, because it doesn't have an exit, doesn't have any enemies, and the coolest thing about it is the glimpse of the starry background at the top, which is a background that goes completely unused in the final game. And finally, unused level 15 looks like nothing more than a test stage. The Hammer Brother never shows up in-game if you manage to play the level, the stacked cloud platforms are unused outside of this level too, and things like the Bullet Bill have no functionality at all. Level 15 was the last unused level, but it wasn't the last unused area. That would go to this stage exit, which is located to the right of 4-5's Tanuki's suit room. It goes unused because it's not used in 4-5 or anywhere, but it looks like really any other stage exit, so nothing really special here. Well now it's time to move on to the unused graphics. And what better thing to begin with than the pretty well-known hammer suit sliding graphic. Normally when using the hammer suit, Mario is unable to slide with it. But by picking up the suit when Mario is already sliding shows this graphic that isn't technically unused, but is something Nintendo clearly thought about since they made a texture for this specific situation, and the only way to make it show up is by doing this in the bonus room of 6-10. A lot of the other unused graphics are arguably for smaller things than the sliding hammer suit, like the alternate front-facing sprite for Frog Mario, a P inside of a circle which is in the graphics bank used for the King's Chambers in Toadstool's letters, a background version of Toad which is stored in the same place, the Super Mario Bros. 2 looking brick tile that I talked about earlier, and an open version of the small chest present in both sprite and background format in the ROM. When navigating the map, Mario always has this animation no matter what direction he's going, but it seems like Nintendo had plans to give him directional movement animations like in Super Mario World, but it just never made it into the game. I'm guessing the reason this wasn't used was because either Nintendo had time constraints and couldn't finish it for some reason, or they just didn't like the way that it looked and just backpedaled. The next three things are included in the map item graphics and the map blocks, consisting of a question mark, which is actually present for two frames when you choose continue on the game over screen, this castle texture that could have been for a fortress too, but isn't used, and this skull that's in the map sprites, and I'm going to take a wild guess and say that maybe it was going to go on top of a stage tile when the player got a game over, but there's no telling. The farthest numerical level tile in the game is 6-10, but with the exception of the number 10 tile which was drawn on a single 8x8 tile, many more map blocks were created and went all the way up to 19. This was probably one of the earlier graphics made for the game, judging by the fact that no levels in the game have a numerically higher map tile than 10. The top set of tiles are how 11 through 19 appear in the game, the middle ones are the top ones but filled in, and the bottom ones are a recreation of what the tiles may have looked like if the cyan banner was intended to be on the bottom left of the tiles. So the rest of the stuff here are related to unused level tiles, and to start we have old bushes, border tiles, and clouds. The unused bush tiles were most likely supposed to be used to connect groups of bushes together, but they never were. The border tile is a pretty subjectively weird change, with the black border in the texture just straight up ending halfway through in the used one. I don't know whether or not to prefer the left or the right one, but what do you think? The cloud is by far the most simple one here, with the changes being in the shading and being a slightly different shape. 
Last thing before we get into the desert stuff are these small versions of the platform found in athletic levels. And uh, I don't really think I need to explain this one. So it's time to talk about the desert tiles. The tile set for the desert has more unused tiles than in any other level in the game. Aside from the first tile bank of blocks, the purple pipe connector can be seen in this screenshot from earlier and was later replaced with the brick blocks in the final version of the game. Related objects include what looks like a pipe or a pillar, a sandstone block, background chains, and these three tiles that aren't defined anywhere in the game. They consist of what looks like ladders, two different wall types, whatever that ball object is, and a tile that was intended to connect to the bottom of the pipe connectors as evident by this side-by-side -side comparison to the early screenshot. Plant life can be found in the ice level tile set and is actually used in unused level 7 from earlier. It's worth noting here that these are spawned by the same generator that spawns the runs of bushes from the higher plains tile set, which also generates a snow block under the grass when used in the ice tile set. But because it only spawns the middle snow block here, snow under this grass specifically doesn't give the player slippery ice physics. Graphic files for the sky include unused corner tiles for the clouds, the tiles that are used for the stacked cloud platform seen in unused level 15, and these tiles are for a sky gradient, which is for the same gradient seen in this screenshot from the pre-release. The only thing in the underwater stuff is this animation of what looks to be half of a plane stored in the underwater sprite bank. None of the tiles in this animation are in the proper arrangement by the NES's 8x16 sprite mode, and it was also partially overridden by one tile of the Lava Lotus, so this was either a test for something that has remaining pieces in the ROM, or this was intended to be in something like the airship levels, but was never added for whatever reason Nintendo had to leave it out. The two graphic files for the castle set include this piece of what is assumed to be the top of the door in Bowser's room, since the top of it is covered by two blocks in the fight, and the other is this donut block, which looks a lot like a stone version of the other donut blocks, and this one specifically was actually remastered for Super Mario All-Stars, but it was only ever used in the Mario 3 and Super Mario Advance 4, 15 years after the block was initially made in 2003. World 8 has two animations left out of the game, with the first one including spikes, a wheel, and a propeller that was definitely intended for the tank and the airship levels. And the other animation is of these tank treads. Since this animation specifically doesn't really fit well with the wheel and tread designs that are used in the game, maybe they had planned on making a different shaped tank, or maybe even a larger tank, but this is the most we have of it if it was planned. The last two unused textures are for the two-player level, and for the ending credits of the game. The two-player level has this block that is used in a two-player level, but the reason it goes unused is because it's only used in this two-player level that I talked about earlier. The other thing is a Goomba with closed eyes that was meant to show up somewhere in the ending credits, but didn't. The sprite wasn't used in any of the remakes either, so I think Nintendo just hates this guy. The next section we're going to talk about are the various different bonus games that went unused due to whatever reasons Nintendo had to leave them out. The game has seven other bonus games that weren't implemented, so I'm going to talk about those as well as the backgrounds and text. So normally the bonus games are hosted by this toad as seen on screen here, but there exists a total of four different host graphics, being a Koopa Troopa, Hammer Brother, and another Koopa that's a slightly different color. The host number in this sheet corresponds to whatever result Nintendo had in mind for the bonus games, and in every instance in the finished game, the host number is set to zero, being toad but 1, 2, and 3 do still exist in the game's code, and would have changed the host to either be a Koopa Troopa with a box, one without, and a Hammer Brother. Along with the single background that's used throughout the entire game, there's actually five other variations of the background that ended up not being used. So to start, this is the room with the table that we see in the game, so nothing special yet. The first unused variation is the bonus room, but without the table, then we have the same thing, but with a corrupt blue box. Then we have the same room, but without anything except for the background, which also makes up both background 3 and 4. 
The first non-applicable background is a mock-up of the bonus room with a broken orange box this time instead of blue. And finally, there's an identical version of that but with a taller, different object than before. It's also worth noting that on this bonus room and the last one specifically, the background doesn't actually exist, but the code to generate the bugged objects in the room do. Okay, now for the actual games themselves. The original bonus game structure was supposed to be based entirely around a roll of dice. Every game would open with the die and have different instructions about how to win or to play the game. The dice instructions still exist in the code, but the graphics are lost, and the dice themselves are pushed off screen in a forceful hack by the developers, and the hack also forced the bonus game to bypass the original logic and jump directly into the logic for what would have been the secondary instruction. Basically, whatever was going to come after the dice. The game's code supports a total of eight bonus game variants, with the functionality going unused for six out of the eight games. The hack the developers put breaks most of what's left, and if it's removed, then the functionality of the games come back. The only thing we have right now are some screenshots and leftover text. The first variant, being game zero, is the dice game, and the rewards aren't completely polished, but these are the outcomes. Rolling a 1 gives you an extra life. Rolling a 2 increments the first byte of the active player's score storage, most likely used for storing keys, which is a completely scrapped mechanic, and it's thought that the keys might have been able to remove these locks on the map since they have a keyhole in them. And rolling any other number besides 1 or 2 will give you coins. Bonus Game 1 in the finished game hosts the Spade card game that everybody knows about. The game itself is defined as the Spade game, and its function bypasses the primary logic, being the rolling die, and goes straight to the secondary one, as if you had won the dice game. Removing the hack makes it an undefined dice game that mimics the rolling die, so when patched, it's basically just a copy of the rolling die. Bonus Game 2 is similar, being called the In Spade card game. It has the same function as the last game, and turns into another copy of the rolling die if the game gets restored by removing the hack. As for bonus games 3 and 4, they both seem to be undefined, with placeholder text being these letters, which are the letters C and D in the English version. Bonus game 5 is called Roll an Odd Number. This game is pretty self-explanatory. This text says that if you roll an odd number, then you'll be able to play the roulette game. If you roll an even number, you lose. But if you roll an odd one, a new box appears that says you have three tries. This roulette game normally only has one try, but in this, you get three. There's actually a way to retry over and over by changing this RAM address to anything but zero, and if done right, you'll be able to play the roulette game until either you win or when the counter reaches zero. Pressing A, B, or Start will give you another chance. Bonus Game 6 is the opposite of Game 5, called Roll an Even Number. It's only the opposite in terms of the dice roll, though, as this was most likely the original place for the card game that we all know about. When entering the game, a dialog box shows up that says, Roll an even number, and I'll let you play the card game. And if you manage to do so, it then says, You have two chances try to find a pair of matching cards. It then takes you to the card game that functions exactly like the one in the finished game. Bonus Game 7, being called Back, has got to be the weirdest of the lost games. The game is hosted by one of the Koopas, and the dialogue is really vague, as it only seems to say to return in Japanese. This is the only game where the item on the box in the middle would have a determining factor, with it in this case being either a mushroom, flower, star, or a cloud. And what would that do exactly? Well, it would send you to one of four possible different locations on the map, with the location being determined by whatever item was sitting on the box. Everything else, if there was anything, is currently unknown as this is the only information that we have about Bonus Game 7. It's not known whether this was meant to test something, or if it was just a bonus game that got scrapped. Nobody really knows. It's possible that more bonus games have their remnants in the ROM, as evident by YouTube videos from people like DeckyDot showing off even more functions that I didn't directly talk about. But as far as the confirmed bonus games go, 
the eight games I highlighted here are the most well-documented. Just like with Super Mario World and almost every early Mario title, this game is no stranger to a various amount of changes between versions. There's actually quite a lot of things that they changed in the two years between the game's release in Japan and internationally, and the version in Super Mario All-Stars mixes and matches a lot of the different changes. And what better thing to start with than the title screen? Nintendo decided that for the international version, the trademark symbol should be moved to the right of the three in the logo, when it was originally to the right of the logo itself. This was actually reverted back to the original in Super Mario All-Stars. This is a very minuscule change, but the text in the HUD that says World had one missing black pixel in the Japanese version, with the HUD that appears on the overworld map not having this incredibly small mistake. I'm honestly surprised they even noticed it, and it was fixed in the international version. In the Japanese version of the level intro, the game fades into the level by slowly revealing it with a black iris in effect. But in the international versions, the game instead simply fades into the level from black. All-Stars has a smoother version of the Japanese transition, thanks to the Mode 7 capabilities of the Super Nintendo, and arguably the biggest thing that was changed for the international release was the damage system. In the Japanese version of Mario 3, getting hit with any special power-up causes Mario to shrink down to small Mario. This was apparently deemed to be a little too hard for overseas players, so it was changed so that now, getting hit with anything above Super Mario reverts back to that. This made the game obviously way easier, and it's honestly the version I would prefer to play on anyway, so... Losing power-ups is also different. If you get hit with a special suit, it plays a unique sound effect as well as showing a silhouette of a power-up flying off of the player. Obviously this was removed from the international release, and the animation is now just a flashing version of whatever the prior power-up the player has. A really unique thing that they changed was that in the Japanese version, if Mario gets hit while wearing Goomba's shoe without a special suit, the shoe would turn red unless you had any of the rare power-ups. I really don't know why they would change that, but they did. In the Japanese version of the Toad House, Mario can move around before Toad even finishes talking. But in the international versions, you have to wait until the message is completely finished. Even something like beating the game is different. In the international versions, after beating the game, the player is able to go back into World 1 with a full inventory of P-Wings. But in the Japanese version, nothing happens. As far as I'm aware, you get completely stuck on this curtain and are forced to reset if you want to get back into the game. So I guess we have no choice but to reset to move on to some more stuff. Time to move on to talking about the design changes to levels, dialogue, and some extras, with the first change coming from the World 1 Fortress. The original Japanese version of the Spike Room was much harder, with a smaller platform as well as not having a spike gap above the door. This was changed for the overseas release to be much easier, with the door being right up against the wall now, as well as the platform being longer and the gap being on top of the door now. The King's Chamber was the next thing to be redesigned for the international release. The background was brightened a little, the stairs were made to be a little wider, with them also being changed from cyan to looking more gold, the background pattern was changed, the shading and the pillars were changed with them also removing the middle one, the pillar on the right was changed to be in front of the stairs, and probably the most noticeable thing, Mario now stands in front of the stairs instead of being on the left of the screen. The box of text in the chamber was also changed to fit the translated dialogue, as well as changing the color of the box itself to be brighter. This change is also probably why they removed the middle pillar for symmetry with the box of dialogue. The box of text was also slightly altered for the minigame cutscenes too, but aside from the box being widened, it's the only thing they visually changed here. The first non-castle level to have a design change is 5-1. In the Japanese version, you have to go into a pipe to get to the end of the level, but in the international versions, they completely removed this and the beetle that's right there, 
and instead made it a seamless transition to the end. Changing this wasn't actually something Nintendo planned on doing, but did to fix a bug that happened if you used a P-Wing to fly over the wall at the end that revealed an unused exit that does this if you exit through it. Nintendo also decided to change the rewards that you can get from the Mushroom House in World 6. The Japanese version has a hammer suit in all three of the chests, but it was changed to randomly give you a Super Mushroom, Fire Flower, or a Super Leaf in the International. All Stars reverted it back to hammer suits, so I don't know why they would do this, but they did. And in perhaps the biggest change in the entire game, for the International release, one tile was removed from the end of the final ship before Bowser. No, but really though, they changed this to make it easier to jump back onto the ship from the water. But in All-Stars, they changed it right back to how it was before. In the ending credits, the international name for World 8 is called the Castle of Koopa. But before that, it was called the Castle of Kappa. This was actually the first time that the Koopa spelling appears in a Mario game, not counting the box art for the original Super Mario Brothers. No classic Mario title gets everything grammatically correct, and this famous mistake in Revision Zero of the US version is a prime example. The original text for this minigame used the wrong your, saying, miss twice and you're out, when it should be spelled this way. Since there's no more room in the box without making it even wider, Nintendo decided to swap the last sentence with this one, which is a lot better, but the funny thing is that they didn't even fix it for All-Stars. <laughs> they had so many years to fix this, but you know what? Since it's a good game, I'll let it pass. In Revision Zero of this note from Princess Peach, she talks about an item called Karibo's Shoe. She's actually talking about the Goomba's Shoe, but whoever was translating the dialogue didn't know that the enemy had its name changed to be Goomba's Shoe instead, so in Revision 1, it was corrected to be Goomba's Shoe. In the US version of Bowser's letter, the original author of it signed his name as King of the Koopa. The Japanese version of this has it signed with Bowser's Japanese name, and the European version has it signed as Koopa Troopa, so whoever was in charge of fixing the translations for the letter most likely looked at the manual for the original Super Mario Bros, where Koopa is the name of Bowser as well as being the name of the Koopa enemies. In the original game on the NES, when picking up a question orb dropped by the Boom Boom, picking up the wand, or having a bob bomb explode will trigger a small flash of rainbow colors for around a second. The Virtual Console version changes this so that the screen instead turns bright yellow to be a little more tame on the eyes, and also to reduce the risk of someone having a seizure from it. And with that, that's pretty much everything. Well, that's just about all of the unused content that exists for Super Mario Bros. 3. So I said at the start of the video, and I'll say it again, but this video would not be possible without sources like the cutting room floor, and if anything, they deserve the credit when it comes to the research for these videos. Most, if not all of the writing in this video is directly attributed to the cutting room floor's article for Super Mario Bros. 3. The only thing I'm doing is putting the page for Super Mario Bros. 3 in a video form. So again, if you're interested in the unused content in various different video games and would like to learn more about other games, then I would highly recommend checking out the cutting room floor, as videos like these would not be possible without them. Well anyway, I've been rambling for a while now, so I think I'm going to head out. If you enjoyed the video, then you should totally subscribe to the channel. I'm thinking about expanding my content out again with a wider variety of topics, and maybe some more iceberg stuff, but I'm not really sure right now. I do want to make an iceberg video again in the future, but I just, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Alright, I'll stop yapping and get out of here. Thanks for watching, guys.